Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a coffee because uh, I had to have a few of them. Yeah, th thank you for having us here. Our, we have a big group uh, that joined here this year. Uh, last few years, we've been doing this virtually, at least our group is, and it's good to be here. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, geospatial data science. Uh, I titled it an experiential journey because we're going to go from end to end, um, all the way from production of uh, data sets that feeds into the machine learning uh, aspects and, and then do the actual applications at the end. Uh, like Gabriel said, I am the co-chair of the Earth Science Informatics uh, Technical Committee. I have been chair for, for, for quite a while now. There is an election coming up, so if you're interested, please submit your name. Um, I also support NASA's Science Mission Directorate, um, uh, doing some AI stuff there. Um, but most closely, I'm part of the NASA Impact Group, which does a lot of uh, data systems related uh, work, looking at technology and how to uh, infuse that into our system, supporting our user base. All right, so I said we have a big team, and this is this is the team who uh, worked in uh, for this summer school. Uh, most of them are here. You'll see them throughout the day. Some of them are supporting virtually. Uh, this took a lot of effort because this is we're going from end to end uh, of the data data science life cycle. Uh, so please ask them questions if you have any. We will be around uh, for next few days, but. Uh, we use our contact information from our uh, workshop summer schools page to contact us if you if you have any questions in the future. So these are the goals of our uh, session today. So we've been doing this for last few years, like I said, and, and last few years we've been focusing on certain aspect of uh, machine learning. Uh, but this year we thought, why not put that all together and go end to end? So this is very a little bit ambitious to do it in one day. Probably needed two, two days to do this, but we'll try to squeeze in everything in one day. Um, the goal here is to build capacity, right? Uh, as, as a government agency, um, we, we want people to use our data. It's taxpayer funded uh, effort. We want people to use it. And part of that is also teaching people how to use it. Like I said, we wanna do the full scope of data science from product generation to doing processing analysis and ultimately doing the applications. Um, we also are looking into future, and this is our this is what we th think where we think the future is going uh, in terms of machine learning is the foundation models, and we have an example of that focused on geospatial data. And obviously, we want to do hands-on experience, right? Latter half of the day today will be mostly focused on hands-on uh, stuff, where we will use cloud-native tools to do some interactive analysis with the with the with the data uh, newly generated data. Uh, we'll do some practical applications with geospatial foundation models. And we also learn how to fine tune some of these models, right? In our vision, these models will be there, will be generated by, by industry or academia. Uh, we would need to know how to tune that into our specific applications. Um, and that's what we'll show at the, uh, at the end today. And obviously we want this to be very interactive. Uh, we want to build collaboration for the future. Uh, we want ex people to exchange the ideas, right? We're, machine learning is such a big uh, area. It's exhausting trying to follow all, everything that's being developed, right? So we can't do everything by ourselves. So it's, uh, I hope this provides a forum for us to exchange ideas and build collaboration for the future. Okay, I'm going to quickly go over data science. I'm sure a lot of you already know. So there are so many definitions of data science, right? Uh, the one the figure on the right is mostly what everybody has seen. It's ways to get from data to insight, right? That, that's a very clear definition that you find um, in the literature or even uh, blogs and, and, and so on. But the one that I particularly like is from this National Academies of Science, where it says that it's a much broader, which is a process or concept of evol involving uh, principles from all the way from data generation, collection, uh, cleaning, processing, analysis, right? And then ultimately developing applications around it in, in a much more data, big data uh, kind of approach. So that's what we are going to do today, hopefully. But I want to show uh, the role of data here first, right? So if you look at data, uh, especially in the science sense, it goes through this life cycle, right? You have a mission, um, 
especially in NASA, uh, NASA terminology, we have mission, we do standard product generation, uh, it goes into the, uh, it goes to systematic process of being ingested and archived. Then you have the, all these discoverability aspect. Uh, this is a very iterative process with a big engineering effort here, right? And part of that will be shown today. Uh, I'll, my colleague Brian will show how this, how we go through this process of uh, generating new products, storing it, archiving it, right, and making it uh, available for for our science users for analysis. Mm -hmm. So the inner cycle is kind of like a data life cycle, and the outer cycle is here the research life cycle. And it's fairly complicated if you look at it. And in, in, in today's session, we'll try to go through this research life cycle, right, from end to end. So what are the skill set required, right? It's very high level. Data science is that this, this centerpiece where it's a combination of analytical skills, uh, technical skills, and some domain knowledge, right? And it's very hard to find people with an intersection of all that uh, qualities. If you look a little further down, so these are all the expertise that are required. So you need some mathematical skills to do some modeling, uh, statistical uh, modeling. You need programming skills to do to play around with the data, some do some modeling. You need machine learning uh, expertise to do uh, predictive modeling, right? Um, you need some visual visualization skill to uh, to infer what's uh, what is happening. And obviously, you need domain skills to to go through the complexity of the of the science side of the things. So that's why we have a big team here today to go through this because not any any of our team members do not have all these skills. So we brought the whole team to go through the whole process. So now let's focus on the geospatial domain. Why is it relevant uh, now? So I'm going to give you some background on on. Uh, from the data side, right? So this is what the NASA's Earth Science Fleet looks like in uh, right now, 2023. You look at all the missions. There are some of these are collaboration with uh, international agencies like JAXA and ESA. Uh, but you see the you see the the scale of this, right? There's so many missions going on or coming up in in near future. So what that means is. This right now we have about six. This is about a year and a half old, but sixty-two petabytes. I think it's it's past eighty petabytes now. Look at the scale of this data, right? And the users we're supporting. But interestingly, this is what it looks like in in a couple of years, right? It's it's exponentially growing. So the problem here is that the, the way we're doing science now is not going to scale, right? It, it's not possible for human to sift through that much data to do science. So that's why we rely on data scientists approach, uh, new technologies to store the data, uh, manage the data, and also do the science. So in our sense, data science is actually a science itself. Uh, people don't treat it as a science. Uh, it's not a physical science, but it's actually a science, but it goes through the same process of scientific experiment. So yesterday we uh, our, uh, there was a big discussion about open science, right, uh, and infrastructure, especially cloud. So I wanted to put this slide in there because we're going to be touching on all of these uh, today. So this is NASA's open science effort, where it's the four pillars that we're looking into in, in terms of uh, open science that applies to data science are the policy, infrastructure, research and application with uh, with leveraging the partnership. That's where we're going to focus today. And the community aspect, which what we're doing right now. So policy, we've had uh, open data policy for like the last two decades. Our data is free for anybody to use for any purpose, right? But, but with the success of that policy, we're moving into the open science, which includes this additional aspect of making infrastructure available for our users, uh, doing research and applications at scale with partnership like IBM, uh, who, are, who are here today and building communities using forum like this. So all of that will be, uh, we'll touch on all of this uh, today. So in terms of what we wanna do today, um, so it will be broken down into four ma major chapters. We'll start with large scale data processing led by Brian Freitag here. He's gonna show us how we're leveraging cloud because our data is moving to the cloud. So it makes sense to do processing in the cloud, generate data in the cloud. 
and yesterday's talk really dovetails well into today. Um, then we'll look into how we do analysis in place using the data that's in the cloud from the data that we actually generate, right? Um, and we, Brian will show some of the examples of real world application where we're actually using this. Then we move on to in the afternoon, some theoretical aspects of foundation models, especially geospatial foundation models, why it is important, where the future is uh, in terms of machine learning. Uh, we'll learn how to fine tune some of these models and do some interactive uh, applications, mostly focused on blood, uh, blood flood and burn scars uh, to one of the two, two of the major uh, applications that have shown to build the, uh, or surpass the state of the art in terms of uh, machine learning. And finally, we'll, uh, we'll have some interactive session, session on learning how to fi fine tune for your own application. So visually, this is what it will look like. Uh, the morning session is mostly focused on data system side of the things, right? How we are generating uh, this harmonization of two different uh, types of uh, data sets, one generated by ESA, one from NASA, uh, USGS NASA, and, and developing this uh, new product. Uh, then trying to do uh, some analysis on top of that using the application side, right? Uh, here, the, the green boxes are where we'll do some interactive components. The other ones will be uh, mostly demonstration. Uh, maybe next time we'll do a, a much more interactive uh, sessions, maybe two days session where we go through interactive lessons on how to do the data system side as well. Okay, I showed this figure earlier, right? So the idea here is that, yes, we have the data layer, which is the center of gravity here, and we do research, right? Can we augment this process now building foundation models where people can leverage not just the data, also the model to do their science, right? This is our ultimate goal. We think that this will accelerate the research and applications of uh, geospatial science, but still yet to be seen. This is just an exploratory kind of effort that we're doing, and I'm sure it will. Uh, there will be a lot of lot more sessions around this in IGARS as well. Okay, so this is what I think we should have at the end of the day, uh, takeaways, right? Uh, I hope that every one of you will take away that data science is much more than applying machine learning to science data. It is a full uh, science field in its own. Uh, it, it is very, it, it's going to depend on domain, right? Uh, we are looking at geospatial science here today, but uh, when you apply to other domain, there's different complexities. So it, it's probably not gonna translate uh, very easily from one domain to another. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit about how large scale data uh, production is done at the mission level uh, at, at agencies like NASA, ESA, and so on. Um, uh, there's much more room to do this kind of uh, harmonization and fusion in the future. Um, there's a lot of effort going on at agency level like ESA also. Uh, which I think will be helpful for most of you to learn. And um, the interactive session will probably teach you how to establish a data science environment within the current scope of uh, infrastructure like cloud. Uh, and, and finally, I think uh, the future, you get a taste of how to utilize some of these uh, newer generation large scale models for applications. And with that, I want to thank GRSS, Gabriel and his team for organizing this, uh, Earth Science Informatics Technical Community, University of Iceland, obviously, IBM research folks who uh, traveled all the way here, uh, the development seat colleagues who put together uh, the data, data harmonization effort with Brian, and all the participants for being engaged. Hopefully you're engaged and don't fall asleep with all the talks. All right. Well, uh, thanks for having me. I do appreciate the opportunity to come here. Iceland is one of my favorite places. This is my fifth time being here. Uh, so always a, a good excuse to come for work. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Brian Freitag. I am out of NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, I've led the development of the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 data production over the last three years. I think we started right before the pandemic started. Um, and to this point, we've generated somewhere on the order of about 
three to four petabytes of data uh, and then moving toward uh, a full four petabytes by the end of this month. So what is HLS? So I'm not sure if any of you have heard about the send to like product that's produced on the European side. Uh, it's very similar to that. So the Europeans take their send to like product and they do a 10 meter resolution. They bring Landsat to 10 meters. Um, that's their fused product. Their harmonized product takes the data at the native resolution and then has a 30 meter Landsat output and then a, a 10 meter uh, Sentinel output. For us, harmonized basically means that we're using this data from the two similar instruments but then we also put it onto the same grid at 30 meter resolution and make it analysis ready so that you could basically take a pixel from a, a Landsat observation and a pixel from a Sentinel observation. And that would be the same pixel in space uh, that you guys could do a time series analysis on. So it allows to do a more dense time series analysis on a specific location at a specific uh, you know, region of interest. So some general overview of the, the bands, band information here. So if you're not aware, Sentinel-2 is a, a passive sensor, basically, it's just like your eyes see. So it just basically you know, takes in a lot of the optical uh, and visible portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so if you were to go in and you were to look at one of the, the products that we've put together, the HLS S30 product is the Sentinel one, um, you'd see that the band information for those specific HLS S30 data files matches the band naming that we have here from, uh, from S2. We inherit that from both uh, S30 and L30. You can see that they range from the near infrared, uh, or sorry, the, the shortwave infrared, back to uh, the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Everything is going to be in reflectance units that we develop through there. Looking at Landsat, again, we retain that band uh, name as in our data file. So everything that we generate is going to be a band separated uh, TIFF, cloud optimized GeoTIFF. And so the difference between the two is we have nine. Uh, bands within Landsat that are in, or sorry, eight bands. We don't carry the uh, panchromatic band that Landsat offers. Um, so we have eight bands in the visible uh, and shortwave infrared uh, portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then we also have two thermal bands that we do retain. Uh, we do put those on a 30 meter grid as well, but you can't really harmonize uh, thermal data uh, with Sentinel-2 just because Sentinel-2 doesn't have thermal data. So uh, it would just be thermal data on an HLS uh, grid as opposed to um, anything that's really harmonized at that point. So one of the main questions we always get is, well, what is, what is the benefit of harmonizing the data? Why do we really care? And so this is uh, a very slow playing movie. Uh, sorry, it's playing so slowly. Um, but this is from the Nash, uh, NASA Science Visualization Studio. And it shows, this is if you have two Landsats in orbit, which we do, Landsat 8 and 9. And when you start to add the Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B satellites, you can start to see a much clearer picture of the globe. And so by harmonizing the data, we're able to get a full picture of the globe at a 30 meter resolution about every two to three days. It kind of depends upon where you are in terms of your latitude. As you move forward, you get maybe a revisit every two days. You move toward the equator every three. And then obviously, we, you know, cloud cover is going to be a big, a big issue here with optical data. So if it's super cloudy, we don't process it just to kind of save on some compute costs. But again, so if you take a look, now that we've got all four uh, satellites in Constellation, we're able to get a really clear picture of the globe at a plot scale. So if you're looking at, you know, like a, a farmland or something like that and understanding what maybe happened with the cropland or if the crop is, you know, healthier or not, you're able to do that much better than you can with some of the satellites that we have uh, that are, you know, from NASA side at the, the one kilometer spectrum. Um, and then with the Sentinel-2s, which you use them on their own, you get revisits every five days. So you're able to get a little bit better picture in terms of what's happening within the time series. So scaling this to global production. So before we were given uh, the data product, we had this grid that we were working with from the data team from Goddard. So this is an effort that was originally, uh, the algorithm was developed at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. They passed it off to us to kind of scale it up and migrate it to the cloud. So this is what they had essentially put in place, this grid where they had North American coverage and then wherever a scientist would come and say, hey, we want HLS data over this area, can you, can you produce it? it would produce it, which is why you see a bunch of patchy areas you know, across the globe elsewhere. The way that they had done their algorithm was basically everything was containerized to give me the input data and give me the output data. There was no logging in between. So it was either a failed granule and you don't know where in the process it would fail, um, or it was a successful run and then you had your data product. So there really wasn't a whole lot of feedback throughout the, the process of the algorithm uh, either. So we kind of had to do some optimization 
uh, to make it run efficiently in the cloud, make sure that we have logging and understand how that works. And then also we had to scale it up in terms of its um, the number of granules that we were producing every day. So this is what the algorithm workflow looks like. So you take the data, the input data, and everything that's in gray was essentially how they had packaged it as one container. So it was just basically a block of code, black box, fail or pass. And that's essentially how it came. What we wanted to do is kind of break this out into individual containers. So the way that we did is to kind of make it a bit more user-friendly, to be able to port it into the cloud, make it a bit more uh, easily understandable within an open source environment. We broke out the atmosphere correction. We get that component from the USGS. So that's a container that we deploy within ours. Um, the cloud masking is another container. We get that from a group called FMask. They basically provide all the cloud mask uh, bits that we put together that's output into our QA or FMask data layer. We do our regridding. So that's basically where we put everything onto the same grid and uh, make the Sentinel data move to a 30 meter resolution. And then uh, we have our BRDF normalization and then the bandpass adjustment. So I think one of the ones that we always get is well, what is a bandpass adjustment? Um, many, I'm sure some of you are at least aware, but what is what are we actually doing when we do a bandpass adjustment between Landsat and Sentinel? And so this is a really nice graphic that the USGS has kind of put together. You can see the various bands. So the gray here uh, at the top is going to be a Sentinel-2 bands. That's the same for A and B. Uh, Landsat-8 is the same for Landsat-8 and Landsat-9. And so you can see as we look at, you know, the various band combinations here that, you know, two is a little bit different with Sentinel and, and uh, Landsat, same with three, four, uh, five, and, and uh, 8A. So these different, these slightly um, different ranges within the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum between the two sensors, we have to adjust for that. Otherwise you get differences in terms of what the reflectance values would be in those specific windows. Uh, and so what we do with the bandpass adjustment is we take the Sentinel-2 data and then we match it to the Landsat. So that's basically saying if we had band 12 here from Sentinel-2, we would apply, it's just a linear curve, to the Sentinel-2 data so that then it would match the reflectance values for Landsat-8 band 7. So this is what we did when we expanded out to global coverage. So I showed you what that initial one looked like before, where we kind of had that patchiness. This is our global coverage. So we basically say all land outside of Antarctica. Uh, and so what we did is we take the, the NOAA coastlines data set. We basically take a one kilometer buffer around the coastline and anything that intersects that one kilometer buffer, we retain it uh, outside of Antarctica. And so you can see we get all these uh, islands in the Pacific. Uh, we have you know pretty much anything that you would want uh, in terms of uh, land coverage. What I will say is a lot of these islands are, are typically going to be covered with cloud. So you may not get your two to three day revisit period there. You may have something on the order of you know, 10 to 15, depending upon you know, what the situation may look like. We have our atmosphere correction code. We have it time out at 90 minutes. And so in complex scenes like this, where you have a small island uh, with a lot of water around it and cloud cover, we tend to get timeouts. And so it's, it's fairly likely that at least over some of these smaller islands out here um, in the uh, Western Pacific, that you may not get that two to three day revisit period that you see maybe if you were to go inland into Europe or the United States. So this is a high level data processing workflow. And so this is basically how do we get the data from our system into you? And I'll get a little bit more detailed into our system here in a bit. But basically the way that it works is we get the data uh, from the USGS. So they're the ones that provide the Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 data. They host everything in their AWS S3 bucket. Uh, we basically have, if you're familiar with the AWS, they have a, a simple notification message or a cloud notification message to tell us when they have new data. So we subscribe to that. That uh, triggers our ingestion workflow to, to start processing that granule. To get the data from ESA, we have access to their international hub. Uh, so this is basically, we have a downloader. That's what that DL is. We have a download script that basically gets everything over HTTPS and brings it in. And so we download every file that intersects that tile list that I showed you just a minute ago. Um, so it's quite a bit of data that we get from ESA every day. I think it's on the order of about three ter uh, terabytes of data uh, that we get from them. Once we get that data, uh, we wait for this uh, LADS data. So this is atmospheric correction data. So it's basically giving you surface reflectance from MODIS. And then you also have the aerosol optical thickness uh, from MODIS. And then uh, once that data comes available, typically that's our two to, it takes about two to three days. So our latency is going to be on the two to three day window based on this uh, atmospheric correction data. Once we get that in, we're able to then process the granules and run atmospheric correction on that. So basically what that means is we just take the Sentinel-2 data, the Landsat-8 data, 
and we remove the atmosphere. So if you look across the atmosphere, uh, particularly maybe if you know you live in uh, the northern United States or in a particular area around an, an urban center where it's hazy, you want to strip that out so that you can actually see what's going on at the land surface. So atmospheric correction basically does that with the, the input data that we provide there. We run the Lasorc algorithm. We run that processing workflow that I showed a little bit ago, and that generates your L30 and S30 products. So I mentioned uh, HLS is two separate products. L30 is the Landsat component. S30 is going to be the Sentinel-2 component. With that, and I'll show this in a little bit more detail later, we provide metadata, we provide a thumbnail image, and then we provide all the data bands uh, that go along with that. That pushes then to an S3 bucket. Uh, so that's a, an S3 bucket that we manage. We have a staging bucket that we use, and then we send a bunch of cloud notification messages to say, hey, come get our data. So we stage the data for the DAC, which is Distributed Active Archive Center. So if you were to go look for HLS and LP DAC, you'd find our data set landing pages. They're the ones that are actually going to be distributing the data. If you were to go download that data, or at least access that data, you would not be getting that from our group. Uh, it would come directly from the LP DAC. They then store it and archive it. That's their responsibility to do that. They maintain an active and an archive copy. We also serve our data through WorldView. So if you've ever seen NASA WorldView, we have another processing workflow where we send them a notification. We have to regrid it to match their grid. And then we provide the static imagery to, to the Gibbs WorldView team so that you can access it through a WMTS layer. Uh, and then you can also visualize it within NASA WorldView. So this is our system architecture, and I don't know how familiar many of you are with AWS. I think there was a question about that yesterday, and there was maybe a handful of you that said you were. Um, but if you take a look, again, this is our international hub, and this is our downloader. So this is basically setting up Lambda functions whenever we get our, our data downloaded. Uh, same thing with the, the Landsat data access. And this is the LADS data that we were talking about before. So all that comes into this uh, scientific processing system. And the way that we run everything is going to be through AWS Batch. And so we basically trigger a step function execution to say, hey, take our containers that we have, send it through a batch environment and a batch queue. And then we run the different containers. So we talked about the uh, container for atmospheric correction, talked about the, the regridding container that we have. Um, the F mask is embedded in here uh, somewhere as well. And then it generates that output data. And then the land of functions that trigger the, the cloud notification messages that then ingest into Cumulus or through using Cumulus into the DAC so that you can go get the data. The way that you would explore and find the data would be through NASA's Earth Data Search Client. Uh, that's the easiest way for you to, to find the data and search for it and download it. Um, and one other thing that we've added, so when we first started, uh, there were some issues with the download, uh, the download script that we had with ESA. We weren't getting the throughput that we needed to download all the files. So we started getting behind. We also have times where the LADS data is delayed in terms of uh, getting into the system. And so there might be three or four days that we don't produce data. So we tied alarms to that. So we set up our CloudWatch alarms to get auto automated emails and uh, Slack notifications that if the system goes down or isn't processing as expected, we kind of get a notification quickly so that we're able to act on it and figure out if it's, if it's a problem you know, within our system. Uh, we've had that happen where uh, Amazon machine images were updated and, and it broke our system for a week. Uh, or if it's something where maybe the data just isn't getting into the system uh, because of you know end user uh, not providing the data. So in terms of the demand, so like, what does it actually look like? We have two processing modes that we typically will, will use for HLS or that we use for HLS. One is the forward mode. So as you get new data from the satellite, that would basically be the you know USGS or ESA. They get the data, they process it to their level one. We would take that, process it to level three. That would be your forward stream. So as they get that new data in, they serve out that level one data. That would trigger our workflow, and we would generate our level three products Typically what you would get on that is about 15,000 files per day. Um, so that would roughly be on the order of about 8,000 scenes uh, for HLS S30 and maybe 7,000 scenes for HLS L30. It is highly seasonal. So right now we'd be getting a lot more scenes than if it was in December uh, when Northern Hemisphere is in uh, winter. Um, so just be aware of that if you're looking at, you know, counts for whatever reason. But typically that's gonna be running one time a day unless there's some hiccup. So for example, if the LADS data isn't available, and we're not able to, to process the HLS L30 and S30 products, we then have to wait. So we may process two or three days at a time uh, if it's backed up because of our input data. Uh, but for the most part, you can expect that we're roughly running about 15,000 files per day within the forward mode. 
Right now, we're also doing our historical processing. So we started that in um, March. And what we're basically doing there is we executed a data transfer study with ESA where we wanted to get the Sentinel-2 data archive from September 2020 back to uh, November of 2015 when the Sentinel-2A uh, mission went operational. That was about 5.7 petabytes of data that we had to get from them. And so we executed a data transfer study to get the data. And we were able to get that from them in about a month's time. Um, so we were able to kind of get that data pretty quickly, but now we've got to process it, right? And so we're doing our historical processing uh, to process that, you know, five years, six years of data from ESA. And so we spun that up in March. We're going fairly quickly, but not all that quickly. And so this is basically where we're processing data that is not necessarily current. We're trying to either, maybe it's a reprocessing campaign, or in our case, we're filling out the remainder of the archive. Um, right now, we're currently running at a rate of about 150,000 files per day. And so on the right-hand side, you kind of get a picture of what that actually means. So if you were to go download one of the granules, so this is this box here represents a granule. Um, within that granule, uh, you'll see that we have several metadata files. So that would be your JPEG, XML, stack metadata. So it all is cloud optimized data formats. So we want to have stack metadata for cloud, uh, cloud-based web clients to be able to access it efficiently. Um, then we have our QA TIFF. So that's our FMAS TIFF, which basically shows where cloud mask is, or if there's ice, water, any kind of contamination, uh, we would retain that there. Solar zenith angle viewing, uh, solar azimuth angle, uh, viewing zenith angle, viewing azimuth angle, all those are served in, in band separated TIFFs. And then we have all the TIFFs that we showed in the, the band uh, information for S30 and L30. So for S30, we carry 13 data, data bands. For L30, I think it's 10 data bands that we carry. So you can see that Roughly speaking, each granule that we produce is going to be about 20 files. So when we talk about 15,000 files per day, that's roughly 300,000, or sorry, granules per day. That's on the order of about 300,000 files that we generate and stage and serve to the LP DAC. Um, when we're doing this now in historical right now, typically we're sending something on the order of about 3 million files uh, to them. Um, and so it is a fairly large volume that we're trying to produce at the global scale. Um, I would say again that each day we produce something on the order of about in the forward stream about two terabytes of data uh, per day. Um, so whenever we're doing the historical, we're doing about 20 ter uh, terabytes of data per day that we're, we're sending into the system. So it is a fairly large demand that we put on uh, them uh, to ingest the data uh, and then visualize the data through worldview. So our current status. Uh, so what you see is that we've got four satellites in Constellation. Um, you can see that we have uh, the Landsat 8 data uh, goes back to the operational window for Landsat 8, which was 2013. Uh, we have Landsat 9, which launched in uh, September 2021. Um, that went operational January 2022, so we don't carry anything that's in kind of the commissioning phase. We want everything to be validated and in, in, in an operational setting. So we will go back to 2022 for Landsat 9. Uh, so we have four satellites in Constellation as of January 1st, 2022. Right now we're processing Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B back in time. So we're actively doing uh, 2016 and the remainder of 2017 now. Uh, Sentinel-2B launched or went operational, I think July of 2017. Uh, so then if you were to step back through time, 2022, we have four satellites in Constellation. June, 2016, we have, or sorry, 2022 onward, we have four satellites in Constellation, 2021, we have three. June, 2016, two. Uh, Sentinel-2A goes back to November 25th, so roughly December of 2015. So if you go to November 2015, then there's one satellite in Constellation. And so you really start to see the benefit as you go closer to today in terms of the time series uh, analysis. So your time series density is gonna be much greater, say in 2022, than it is gonna be in 2016. And so depending upon what your, you know, what your use case may be, uh, just be aware that that is going to be uh, your revisit period is going to change based upon when that is uh, available. So the data set characteristics. So as I mentioned, everything is regridded from Sentinel's native resolution is 10, 20, and 60. We regrid everything to a 30 meter resolution uh, to match Landsat. Landsat is natively 30 meter resolution. We take their 100, 100 meter uh, thermal data, also make that 30 meters. So everything that you get is going to be that 30 meter resolution uh, out of HLS. 
Our latency is two to three days, like I mentioned before. Typically, that's going to be us waiting on uh, the input ancillary data that we get from LADS to do atmospheric correction. Uh, we're exploring if there's ways to bring down that latency. That's something that we get uh, asked quite a bit. Um, our format is going to be cloud-optimized GeoTIFF. So if you're kind of familiar with that whole cloud-optimized uh, workflow, before uh, we were processing these as HDFs. Uh, now we've kind of migrated to a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, and I'll show you kind of the power of that uh, in a little bit. Uh, again, we do separate all the data bands into their own files. So you would go in and download a data product. You'd see band 1.tiff, band 2.tiff. Uh, that is intentional. It makes it easier to do band combinations and to do uh, like NDVI calculations and things like that. Uh, so we'll see that in our analysis uh, a little bit later. And then, as I mentioned, this is the, the granule package, 13 band separated data files, four angle bands, the QA band, a browse image. So if you were to go to Earth Data Search Client, you can see what that image looks like before you download it. Maybe it's too cloudy uh, over the area that you want and you don't really care. And then you don't have to download that data product. Um, and then XML and stack JSON metadata. So the data set characteristics. Uh, so again, the L30 product goes back to 2013. S30 right now is currently at 2017. Uh, when we finish this historical processing, it'll go back to December of 2015. Uh, the number of granules you see, 10 point, uh, I guess really 10 million files for L30, uh, 12 million files for S30. So again, if you multiply that by roughly 20, you get an idea of the number of files that we've got staged and made available. Our average number of daily files that we have, uh, again, you can see it's a little bit less for L30 compared to S30. It is highly seasonal, as I mentioned. So I think I said something on the order of about 18,000. Um, Typically, it's going to be a little bit higher in the summer months as it is than it is in the lower months, or sorry, in the winter months. And then our daily data volume. So you see we're roughly in the order of two to three terabytes of data that we produce per day. And this is a, a GIF on the right-hand side that I think kind of showcases some of the power of it. This is the evolution of the Mississippi River over the last uh, six, seven years. And so you can kind of see how uh, through flooding and drought, it's kind of affected the, the river and maybe some of the areas around the river. Uh, and especially the drying out that we've seen over the past few years. So there's a number of different science applications that you can use. We're going to do, as Manil said, a couple uh, today, uh, both through our analysis that we do in a little bit, um, and then also through the foundation model where we have uh, the burn scars um, and then the inland flooding. You can also do snow extent. So one of the big pieces of news within the U.S. is, you know, the western United States has been... Uh, fairly rich with snow this year. And so their water uh, drought that they've had over the last few years, maybe will get a little bit of a reprieve for this summer as the snow melts. Um, and you can kind of track that with HLS. It's a uh, Swear false color composite image in the top middle. Agriculture, this is uh, some agricultural fields uh, in Egypt. So you can kind of see again, the green shading in the middle of the desert sand, you're able to kind of track the health of that vegetation. Um, and all this is visual right now in terms of just um, several band combinations, but you can quantify this with indices like we'll show in a little bit. Uh, the inland flooding is another example. We're gonna show that. Uh, this is flooding from Hurricane Ida in New Jersey, uh, United States, and then that's urban monitoring. So if you wanna watch urban uh, growth, this is a color infrared composite. Red here is gonna be vegetation. The gray scarring is gonna be your urban footprint. And that's New York City uh, that we have there. And so if you're in a developing country, you wanted to maybe see the urban growth over the 10 year period of HLS, you'd be able to, to take the, the color infrared from both satellites and kind of explore how that maybe has changed as a function of time. So this is uh, something that we did within FIRM. So if you're not familiar with NASA FIRMS, it's Fire Information Resource Management System. And so it's a collaborative effort with NASA and the US Forest Service. And what was asked is that the Forest Service said, hey, HLS is great. We don't really have any visualizations that are, or I guess any data that's at the 30 meter resolution, uh, we're getting a lot of requests from users to be able to take that data and import it into our fire uh, management system. Can we do that? We said, sure, let's try it. Um, and so we basically set up a dynamic tiling service. So what that means is that with the cloud or with the, the data being cloud optimized geotiffs, we don't have any pre-generated image uh, for this. Fires are very small, uh, relatively speaking within the globe. Uh, they're very, you know, they're very confined to a specific time. And so you may not necessarily want to um, have static imagery of the entire globe at 30 meter resolution for the duration of the HLS life cycle. 
Rather, you'd want to be able to dynamically generate the tiles as a user may come in and look at a specific location and generate an image. This is for the Mongolian fire that we're going to look at a little bit later. Um, and so what we do is uh, we serve this through our, our tiling service and we specify three different bands this is for our Swear false color composite. Again, we retain the band uh, naming convention for the Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 and Sentinel 2A and 2B. And so the band numbers are different between the two uh, HLS data products, L30 and S30. But we take the, the SWIR band, the red, um, or sorry, SWIR, near IR, and red. And then uh, we basically take that as a false color composite, import those into the RGB bands, and then you get this SWIR false color composite that shows us the fire line, shows us the smoke plumes, and then it allows us to see the burn scar fairly well. And so that's the end of the presentation. So uh, welcome. Uh, first of all, my name is Lin Song and I'm from IBM Research. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk about some theoretical concepts and some high level overview of geospatial foundation model. So I think this might be covered already, but let me briefly talk about a little bit background. So this effort was initiated earlier this year with uh, the collaboration between IBM and NASA. And uh, so, this slide section will be roughly a 30 minutes theoretical uh, overview and talking about concepts of what are foundation models, geospatial foundation models, and how we can uh, do that. And uh, I think you just went through a couple interesting, you know, hands-on session. And I think later on there are a couple more uh, sessions around interesting first hands experience. So stay tuned also for those. Uh, but yeah, so. I think given all the different backgrounds, uh, I would like to, like before I jump right into uh, the slides, I want to briefly talk about, you know, what are foundation models or geospatial foundation models. So foundation models in general is just large models with, with, which you can uh, pre-train on large volume of unlabeled data. So you pre-train a large model with unlabeled data in an unsupervised fashion, then later on, you know, people can fine tune that model towards different uh, downstream tasks. I think uh, one example we all keep hearing these days are things like uh, ChatGPT. Those are language foundation models. Uh, so what we are trying to build here is the same concept of foundation models, but in the domain of geospatial. And in this session specifically for in the domain of remote sensing data. So the overall workflow is almost identical to any other foundation model. So you will find similar workflow in language foundation model as well, which is essentially you start with pre-training. You start with pre-training with, un uh, with unsupervised or, or self-supervised learning. And this is done by training on large, large volume of unlabeled data. So in the language domain, you basically mask your uh, arbitrary sentence and try to predict that. And uh, in our domain, which I will give more details later, but in our domain, what we do is we just get a bunch of unlabeled remote sensing image and mask portion of that image and try to let the model uh, predict or reconstruct the masking uh, portion of that. And uh, to use the foundation model, to use the geospatial foundation model, we basically fine tune the model uh, towards different downstream tasks. So here you just need a small sample, small number of labeled samples to be able to just fine tune on different tasks. So again, if you think about how this is evolving over the time uh, in the language domain, you know, many years back, people start with, let's see, one model for Q and A, one model for, for sentiment analysis, you know, one model for each task. But nowadays it's like one large foundation model, which you can just fine tune towards all these different tasks. So it's like one pre-trained model for all. So uh, we have the similar, uh, we have same thought here. So previously, if you look at, you know, many models around remote sensing, people would build, let's see, a vegetation model. People would build a burning scar detection model. People would build a, let's see, land use land cover models. So, but what we are trying to do here is, again, one single large foundation model, which you can just tweak a little bit and it can deal with all sorts, all various of different downstream tasks. 
So that's a little bit idea behind that. So just quickly some, some of the concept here. So in the, again, in the language domain, right, to build a model, we need word corpus. So here we also need our corpus for building a geospatial foundation model. So uh, here the corpus is essentially uh, remote sensing uh, data. And what we are using uh, as a starting point is the harmonized uh, Landsat Sentinel-2 data. So some of the uh, numbers here you can see. And uh, just want to emphasize a little bit. So compared to language model, we, uh, or sorry, compared to language data, so remote sensing data actually suffers uh, more issues. So one example is the cloud uh, coverage. So there's a lot of things we need to do for both modeling and uh, pre-modeling, which is the data processing pipeline. So this is on high level, what are the backbones of the model and how the model architecture looks like. So uh, here I'm just gonna make a little bit assumption that most of us are more or less already familiar with you know, transformer blocks or you know, transformer models, uh, which is already you know, super common as a most popular backbone in uh, language models. So what we are using here is the vision transformer backbone. Uh, so I won't go into too much details, but it is uh, fairly straightforward. Like in my mind, it's fairly straightforward to think it this way. So what we do is very simple. For any given image, this actually applies uh, so this was initia initially developed for natural uh, natural image, uh, but just think about an arbitrary image. What you could do is you just split that image into small patches. So at one image would become a bunch of small patches. Uh, that's what's showing on the very left uh, end. Then what you do is you just flatten these patches. So this way you sort of like convert an arbitrary image, no matter it's a natural image or remote sensing image or you know whatever 2D uh, tensor you have, you sort of map that, you, you sort of convert that from an image to a sequence of small patches. And here, if you think each patch like a word token, so here just think that sequence of patches, something like, hey, I am a good, teacher, something like that. So each patch, you can think that as a word token. So the sequence of image patches become a sequence of tokens. And what is a sequence of token? A, a sequence of token is essentially a sentence, a word sentence. So by doing a simple patchify and flattening, what we achieved is we convert arbitrary image into something like a word sentence. So right now it's essentially like we have a sentence. So after this kind of conversion, our input format become identical to the language domain where people just have a bunch of sentences. Then you can pass through the, you know, the common transformer blocks or transformer models there. So essentially if like a straight way to think about this is vision transformer is essentially you do a little bit pre-training to convert a 2D image to 1D sequence of token. Then you can just apply the vanilla transformer, the transformer people all using in uh, language models. So that's just in my uh, mind, the easiest way to uh, think about this. So that's the backbone of you know, uh, what we are using. And in terms of the actual model architecture, it's showing on the uh, right end. So what we do is, we just pick a time series of remote sensing image. So here we do something a little bit different from existing uh, works. So if you look at many existing works, they deal with images, but, in, but we think remote sensing are not really images. It is essentially videos because for any given region, you not only have a remote sensing image, you not only have a static image, you actually have image every, let's say, seven days or one day or 14 days, things like that, uh, given by the uh, frequency of the product. So essentially, we are dealing with videos, remote sensing e videos. I personally, I, I always call it that way. So our model actually takes a videos or multiple frames of satellite image into consideration. 
And we, what we do, again, as I uh, described earlier in the previous slides, we do mask modeling. So we randomly mask some of the portions of the image and ask it to go through our encoder decoder uh, model. And the target would be to reconstruct all these missing uh, portions of the image. So this is just a very high level overview of how the model backbone looks like and how the model architecture looks like. Uh, we do have some detailed novelty, but I think it's not really the focus of this uh, session. Uh, but yeah, this is just a, like a very high level uh, introduction on the model backbone and model architecture. So I think uh, I want to spend a little time talking about uh, some details about the training as well as the data. So remote sensing image, if uh, what well, remote sensing data, if you think about the volume, it is really huge. And although, you know, when we train a model, we always prefer as much data as possible, but practically speaking, it is not really as feasible to train with all the data we have, because we are talking about, you know, five years, 10 years data in a very uh, in comparatively fine resolution available in many different products. So we had to design a few different ways to smartly sample the data. So what we do is given by the weather uh, property of different regions, we randomly sample regions from different zones. And uh, so this gives you a general idea. Uh, this basically increase the variety of the data, but in the meantime, basically keep the data volume as small as possible. Although I'm using the word small, but it is not small. We are talking about volume from one terabyte all the way to tens of terabytes. So for, the, for our very initial model, we trained on one year of, uh, of the data. Uh, the total data volume is roughly one terabyte. And the model size, we start with 100 uh, million parameters and 300 million parameters. Some of the training results, you know, I won't go into too much details. Uh, so before I wrap everything up, I want to uh, quickly show some of the uh, downstream architecture and results we have. I think for some of these, you will have some, or maybe you already have some hands-on, uh, you know, coding session. But uh, on the high level, this is how the architecture looks like. So for a given foundation model, what we do is after it is fully trained, we just grab the trained encoder portion. So these encoder portions are like that encoder, which, you know, is really the key part. It encodes all the information inside. So we basically get rid of the pre-training decoder and plug in different uh, downstream had what we call it had, or you can also call it different downstream decoders to that. Then you just do a few shots. You can just fine tune that with, you know, as small as maybe 10 new images or sometimes hundred images or a couple hundred. Then you can fine tune the geospatial foundation model into a specific task. So in short, you get rid of the pre-training head, you plug in a new head, then you know your model can deal with a new downstream task. That's uh, really the power of foundation model. Uh, so just some of the uh, I would call it maybe preliminary results. Uh, although I'm using the word preliminary, but you will see we actually uh, for some of the initial model and initial result we already beat you know state of art uh, from the previous from many previous works. So this one we are showing is the flood mapping. Uh, there's some, some fancy realization here, but under the hood is really uh, utilizing the model architecture I showed in previous uh, slides. So we just grab the trained geospatial foundation model, get rid of the existing head, plug in a new head, fine tune it a little bit, then it can just generate all these things and which also beat previous uh, you know, state of art uh, results. We also have similar story with fire scar. Again, won't go into too much details. Uh, yeah, so I, I think another thing I want to really emphasize is 
when we talk about foundation model, I think accuracy is definitely one of the things people care most about. But I would say maybe equally important, or, or actually in my mind, it might be even more important than accuracy is the ability to do a few shot fine tuning or the ability to achieve the same kind of performance, but with much fewer data. Uh, why this is so important in language domain, the community is so well established that you we have the luxury to use high volume of label data. Like everyone, they just build a model, they can pass through the fine tuning, benchmarking, you know, they got a bunch of numbers. But that is not true for many other domains, like remote sensing domain is one of the domain where we have a lot of data, but we only have very few well labeled data. So being able, so if one model could achieve the same kind of performance, but with let's see only half of the label data required. So in my mind, that's something really significant and to and in many real world use cases, that is more important than hey, I'm 95% accuracy versus your 93% accuracy. Because many domains, they actually suffer from you know, having enough well-labeled data. So with our uh, geospatial foundation model, what we also observe is that we can basically, for example, for the flood mapping example, we can achieve the same kind of performance compared to previous state of art but only with 50%, uh, with only 25% to 50% of label data required. So that actually saves tons of, you know, effort for human labeling, you know, uh, each image for different downstream tasks. So that is also one thing I want to emphasize, which in my mind is very significant. Uh, also, the third point about you know this spatial foundation model besides the accuracy and being able to use much fewer label data so the third point is we also observed very good generalization so what that means is we uh, for many of the downstream tasks you see here the model actually never saw this time period the model never saw these regions so as i mentioned earlier the pre-training model were actually trained within uh, us and for the time period only one year. But for some of these uh, downstream tasks, these were actually like three years or four years from you know where uh, from when we trained our model. And it is also outside US. So for a region that is never seen, for a time range that is also never seen, we observe very good results when we find two on those unknown region and unknown. Uh, data range. So in short, we observe very good accuracy beating a uh, previous state of art. We observe very good, how do I call it? It requires much fewer well-labeled data. So it can save a lot of manual effort. And the last part is it is it's generalized very well uh, for never seen regions and never seen time range. Uh, yeah, I think that's about the high level overview on um, GeoFM and uh, some of the preliminary results.